Um, thanks very much, Jens. Uh, thank you, Meeting C++, for having me. This is an amazing uh, conference. I knew of it by reputation for a few years now. And, uh, well, reputation that's about to kind of go down the drain in about like 58 minutes. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks very much. Uh, by the way, so Jens and I had a tough negotiation process too. Um, he invited, you know, what do you want to give a keynote? And I said, yes, I will do it for 50,000 euros. <laughs> Sounds good, right? It's a good sum, like rolls off the tongue. 50,000, right? I'll do it for 50,000 euros. And Jens said, that's a bit above our budget. I can offer you zero euros. And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> There's no joke. I'm not getting paid for this. But you see, I'm a good negotiator, right? <laughs> Pretty good. Um, but uh, Jan said, you know what? We're going to give you a business class flight. So I was like, yes. OK, I'll take a business class flight anyway. But I'll go to Somalia on a business flight, OK? <laughs> Anywhere you want. So um, great. So I was uh, hanging out in the business class. Uh, uh, seat. It's roomy and nice and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, okay, so I fall asleep, and, and when I wake up, you know those, uh, they bring those uh, things you, you wipe your hands and face with, the, the hot towels, right? So they brought this nice hot towel, and I was asleep, so they left it on the, on the seat, on the, you know, on the armchair, on the arm, uh, you know, next to the seat. Uh, in between me, and it happens to be a fine German gentleman next to me. What is the one quality you would associate with German gentlemen, <laughs> and ladies for that matter, stereotypically? What would be a good? They would be very neat people, very thorough, right? Very orderly. Would you agree with that? I heard the guy say they have no humor. Germans have the best humor. I think it's the rest of the world that they don't understand it. <laughs> like, well, some of the best jokes are from Germans. Anyway, so. Um, so this fine gentleman kind of, you know, so yeah, I get the towel, so it's like, hmm, so I'm getting the towel, it was not very hot already, right, not very hot because I just walk on. So anyway, so I use it, I wipe my face, I wipe my, my hands, and I put it back. And uh, I was thinking, like, this didn't was that fresh of, uh, it didn't feel that fresh. It was like quite a, uh, hmm. So Iceland there, they, maybe they need some feedback there. So anyway, so uh, time goes by, so you know, the plane is about to land, and they bring us another set of hot towels. And I use mine, and the gentleman next to me, he uses his, careful here, and after he uses his towel, he folds it back as it were, as it was, very neatly, you couldn't tell it was used. And puts it back on the, you know, on the same exact place where I took it from earlier. <laughs> and it was at that point, I looked at the guy, and the guy looked at me back <laughs> with a sight, with an, a, a, an expression that I'm going to go, I'm, go, I'm not going to forget for the rest of my life. <laughs> because it was a mix of horror and empathy, and understanding, and even, there's, there might have been, there was just a bit there, he, you know, I'm sure he thought, hopefully this guy may understand the humor of the situation <laughs> that he just wiped his face with my sweat. <laughs> and I burst in laughter, and he was like, oh my God, okay, and he burst in laughter too, and that was our moment. We had the thing. We did have a thing. Well... <clears throat> Uh, however, it was not a big thing, so let's get to the big thing, right? It was a small thing. So uh, the next big thing, so this is going to be a future, a prediction of the future. And as I'm sure you know, predictions are hard, especially of the future, etc., etc. So I'm going to first uh, qualify myself as a fairly good predictor of the future. I was like the guy who would make noise about things before they happened. And by the way, I hate talking about myself. I got to tell you the following. I, don't, I hate talking about myself, right? And probably you're going to hate it too, hearing it. Because just an advice of like social life, we're all programmers, so we're kind of a specific uh, whatever area of the population who is more introvert and whatnot. I'll tell you what. 
the one thing people like to talk about, number one, what do you think it is? Shout at me. The, the most interesting thing for one person to talk about, number one. Yourself. Yourself. Thank you, Guy. By the way, Guy, great. I'm Guy. I have nothing to add. That was awesome. Thank you. So Guy said, Guy did have something to add. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. A distant second will be things they like to do, like cars or whatever, right? And the last thing people want to talk about is who? You, the other guy in the conversation. The other person in the conversation, they don't want to, you know, they have no interest in talking or hearing about you. So at some point, I figured, like, I, I noticed this. I was like, oh, everybody wants to talk about themselves. So this is interesting because uh, I have no interest in hearing about anybody. I like zero compulsion to listen to what they have to say about themselves. Uh, but let me talk about myself because that's going to be a good thing for them, right? That's going to improve their lives right now. Of course not. So then after I noticed this, I decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a point to ask questions and just listen to what people say. And that was like, um, it was like, I don't know, 15 years ago. It, was, it took me a while, right? So, you know, so uh, even once I started doing this, I discovered it was a complete new world. Because once I did that, it was amazing how many interesting things people did have to say. So uh, it was very nice. And at some point, I met this woman, and I told her all what I just told you. I told her all this. And I said, oh, you know, it's, you, don't you think it's funny that everybody wants to talk about themselves, but they don't want to hear about the others, right? So uh, she said, huh, that's interesting. Yeah, you're right. And I said, would you want to be my wife and bear my children? <laughs> right? So like, we got married because you know, the, that was part of our values together. So uh, that said, during the last 15 years or so, or whatever, 20 years, I developed a hatred to talking about myself, which makes it difficult to give talks. And so this is going to be the most difficult part of this talk, because I'm going to talk about myself. All right, I hate doing this, and you're going to hate hearing it. But in 2001, I wrote this book, Modern C++ Design, and today people say modern, colloquially about C++, oh, I, I, you know, how to do some modern. Even in the titles of this conference, there's a bunch of like, oh, this is not C++, it's modern C++. And it all started with my point that, wait, wait a second, templates are important, they're a thing. They're a big thing. Turn out to be a big thing. 2004, not a lot of people know that. I started some stink in a forum said, is the, you know, multi-threading, is the C++ standardization community listening? So I started this thread, it had a kind of a huge uh, kind of uh, development, it took a, a long time. So at some point, uh, it got to the right people. Some of the right people were Doug Lee, who said, huh, uh, you know, he, he told Hans Bohm. Who knows about Hans Bohm? Okay, you owe Hans Bohm multi-threading in C++, you should know this. Right? So Hans Bohm, uh, so Doug Lee, uh, who's coming from the Java multi-threading world, he told Hans Bohm, yeah, you know, there's this idiot on the internet who says something about like, multi-threading in C++. And uh, Hans said, huh, interesting, let me get onto this. So that all started uh, Hans's involvement in, in uh, C++ threads, which led to what we have today. Another, uh, another thing that I've uh, predicted yearly was uh, Voting, online voting is problematic. So this is an old slide of mine. I was going through my yellow period. <laughs> and my face, right? <clears throat> so back then I said, whoa, you know, so, you know, this is like, not everything popular is good, and machines and humans cannot easily cooperate over the same data. So I made a few points about that. But that was 2007. That was way before, like, all of this, like, fake news and whatnot. So I made this point, too. And in the same talk, I made a point that NLP, Natural Language Processing plus the web, they are going to have problems. Guess what? In the future, so that was Amazon 1, 0, and 2, 0, simple data mining. And I said, in the future, people are gonna, uh, Amazon is going to say, this book style might appeal to you because your blog and what you're reading and what you're writing. And guess what? We are kind of getting there. Yes? And you should resolve the fear that the computer follows every step we make. We are here right now. Again, that was 2007, when, like most of you younger ones, you were walking under the table, right? <laughs> Another one. Same talk, same conference. Phone plus net plus automatic speech recognition equals fun. This was before the iPhone. 
This was, be, this was before the iPhone. How about that one? Well, you don't need buttons because you just talk what you want, right? So I made this prediction as well. And, oh, I also had this talk. Well, probably some of you might remember it. Iterators must go. I'm not sure if this is an uncomfortable science or silence or is it like, <laughs> is it bad, good or bad? So, so anyway, so this talk has been a bit controversial because um, some people said um, it didn't exist. So I kind of, I actually, it's, it's kind of funny. Some, some people said you didn't say those things that you said. And I found the, the recording of the talk and I put it online and you know, that kind of solved it. Uh, so currently we have uh, STD ranges, uh, like it, 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 ranges are a very nice uh, success story for uh, C++ and for programming in general. Uh, but, uh, you know, please read this before we continue. Just this is my formal disclaimer so I don't get sued. Right, people in the back, can you see it? All right, thank you very much. So, um, what do you think is going to be big? I'll tell you what's big right now, code size. <laughs> code is big. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> code is big. And it's growing super linear. So it, it, the project that was like yesterday 1 million lines, all of a sudden it got to 10 million lines. I have no idea how. I'm not kidding. So you look at, oh, you know, Windows NT was one, one million lines, and I don't know, Windows NT 3 or whatever the next thing was, was like 10 million lines. Two years later, it's, it's amazing. It, it tenfold in size, it increased tenfold in a couple of years. So um, project size is growing, and all of the simple programs, we're done with them. Truth, truth be told, we wrote them a number of times for, you know, desktop, for laptop, for Android, for iPhone, for what have you. We wrote them a number of times already. We kind of done writing them. So what's left is the big ones, the huge ones, those that you get to talk to your phone as if you have uh, finally a friend, right? And it's automated. Oh, you saw that movie, She? Uh, what is that? Was that her, She? Her, thank you, yeah, great movie. All right, so um, how is the bug rate faring with code size? Uh, please shout, me, shout at me how many bugs do you think code, uh, code has per thousand lines of code in C++? Three thousand. Huh? Three thousand. Sorry? Three thousand. Two? Two thousand bugs per one thousand lines. Okay, that's, that's good. <laughs> it's a good start. It's a, it's a generous envelope. Other thoughts? Uh, let's say delivered code that has been at least tested and delivered. Thoughts? Below 50? 50. Who gives more or less? It, this is a, a great, yeah, you, you, you'd have to give more or less. It doesn't matter. 42, thank you. <laughs> Others, thoughts, ideas? 10. 10, thank you very much. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, it's between 15 and 50, so we are not way off. But the more interesting thing is it's independent of language. So uh, if you're unhappy writing crappy C++ code, no problem. The Ruby guy next to you, he's writing just as crappy code as you. <laughs> no problem there. You're good. I, I love this thing in Europe. They applaud during the talk. This is amazing. In America, they never do that. They just sit there and listen. It's like, oh, what's wrong with this guy? OK. so. <clears throat> Um, there's a, this is one source which is, uh, you know, the, in book format is the easiest to, uh, to look at, but there's uh, numerous uh, research and papers and um, evidence that that's the case. So, you know, look at this. This is interesting because 15 to 50 is, not, is within the same order of magnitude, whereas people say often that productivity, you know, can vary by many orders of magnitude across people, right? The, the, you know, you know the, the whole theory of star programmers, and they're like hundreds of times more productive than your average programmers, etc. But in terms of bugs they produce, we're all about the same. We're all within a narrow range of bugs produced. So that's interesting. So how do we fight this, uh, you know, this uh, crisis that we're facing of uh, we have too much code to write and too many bugs in that code? 
So, uh, oh, by the way, Steve, Steve Yeager is, uh, uh, is known to have said, the worst thing that can happen to a code base is size. And he has a great blog post about that. You can just Google for it. In C++, there are three things that um, deserve attention. Concepts, meta classes, and introspection, slash reflection. And one of them, I'm going to argue, is the next big thing. And please tell me what's your take on the next big thing among these three. Let's say the biggest of the three, right? If there may be something completely different, right? But among these three, which is the biggest? By rounds of applause, please. Concepts is the next big thing. Thank you. Meta classes is the next big thing. I saw the same people applauding twice. <laughs> Introspection is the next big thing. Thank you. Concepts. They add constraints to code. Do they reduce the number of lines of code we write? No. <laughs> Let me make a quick point about concepts, and I'm going to use this uh, contraption here. Give me just one second. All right, so I have this device here, which is going to allow me to draw in real time, and you're going to get to see it. If it all works, it's, it's like it has so many bugs, it's not even funny. <laughs> but let me try and see how it goes. Okay, live view. God, please make it work. Okay. Please make it work. We can't connect to our servers at the moment. That's a good start right there. So I, I swear I rehearsed it. This was the, the most rehearsed part of my talk ever. This is ridiculous. So I can't connect. OK, let me try again. Just one second, you guys. Give me a second. Connected, connected, connected. It's funny. One page says, I'm totally connected. I'm totally good. And the other page says, you're not connected at all. Come on, come on. Yes, Dan Brown. Yes, I know. My mother said, oh, you got to read that. He's doing his research. It's really good. <laughs> All right. You know what? I need to give up on this guy. All right. As I said, it's full of bugs. Uh, it's called Remarkable. It's a thing you can draw on and, and that kind of stuff. And I would recommend it if it weren't so buggy. Anyhow, let me make this point sort of by drawing in, in the air. So imagine we have a set of, you know, we have the set of all programs. Uh, and you divide it in two. So you have two sets now, two subsets. And one is programs that work, that do useful things. And one is the set of programs that don't you work, I mean, kind of compile and run, but don't do useful things. They're buggy or they're, they're not good. So there are these two conceptual sets. And then you have uh, the set of typed programs. How do you think the set of typed programs cut across these sets? Well, uh, the, you know, the, the argument goes, when you have well-typed programs, they're going to eliminate a lot of the bad programs, right? But they're going to eliminate also a few good programs, because there are a number of good programs that are not typed, as any Python programmer is going to be very eager to tell you if you have the time to listen, right? <laughs> they're going to be very happy to talk about how untyped programs, they're awesome, and they, they just work. Right? So, you know, the, the, argue, the counter argument goes well, if you eliminate a, a, a number of useful programs, typing is not that great. And if you don't eliminate all the bad programs, then typing is not sufficient. So, why don't you just unit test everything and call it a day? So, that would be the argument. Now we have programs with concepts. Well, do concepts uh, expand the set of good programs? No, because there are good programs that are not conceptified, right? So they're going to reduce the number of programs you can write. They're also going to reduce the number of correct programs you can write, and that's a problem. So concepts, they add, they make it so we write less, use fewer useful programs. Meta classes, uh, do they add stuff? 
They do something. I'll give them some credit. They do something. They automate boilerplate. So that's kind of a good thing, right? They, they automate boilerplate, so that's kind, of, that's kind of a cool thing. However, I'll come and say, you know, we, I don't want to automate boilerplate. So first of all, they're solving an issue that is in C++. Like, C++ has too much boilerplate. And it, it, it's funny because C++ programmers grew up to despise the boilerplate in Java and other languages. So it's funny that you look at C++ now with R value reference and all. Do you know how many constructors STD optional has? <laughs> Does anybody in this room know how many constructors STD optional has? And it's ridiculous. The STD optional, no documentation, just the, just the bare code, 1,500 lines. It does nothing. It does no work. STD optional, I believe me, it has no algorithm. It doesn't sort anything. Just to make it clear. It, does, it doesn't do any, any computation. It's a Boolean next to a value. Thank you very much. <laughs> 1,500 lines. So we got cursed to the boilerplate we grew up to despise. Oh, that's a great code. Huh. OK, so Ian, save that for, you know, if you want to like a quick code from my talk, this would be it. OK, so um, introspection. Introspection, is, which is really funny, because it's, it's rare to see such, such a bad case of missing the point. Introspection is by people who work on it. By the way, introspection and reflection, I use them interchangeably. But I like introspection because I think it, it's more descriptive. So uh, introspection is you look at the, you know, you can look at the program and it's, you know, kind of introspect its, uh, its uh, structure. You can say, you know, open this uh, class and tell me what the members are. Give me the names of all members in the struct. Give me the names of all methods in the struct or, you know, look up a method in the struct, etc. So introspection is interesting because um, I was saying it's presented as a way to automate boilerplate. And it's nothing like that. It's unbridled cre creativity there. This is amazing. And I find it concerning that people who work on introspection insist that it's only there to automate boilerplate. I, 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 read, I read everything there is to read about introspection in C++. I, looked all, I watched all the talks. Everything, people keep on going, I work on this, it's my, you know, I, I made a proposal, I work on this, and believe me, it's just about boilerplate. It's anything but, okay? If you want boilerplate, go to meta classes, okay? So introspection is the new, next big thing. Because we want to generate more smart code, not more boilerplate. We want to generate code that matters. Because that's how you're going to fight size, by generating smart programs, not dumb boilerplate. Okay. So that takes us to uh, design by introspection, which is uh, sort of the name I branded uh, on, on this, uh, this technique. Design by introspection. So in order to define design by introspection, see what it's about, let's uh, go a bit uh, back in history and start with policy-based design and design patterns. So back in the day, you know, um, by the way, I didn't invent anything. I just gave a name to it. So I have this weird, um, uh, you know, infamy of uh, having defined the name, but not the concept. So policy-based design is pretty much uh, design with uh, templates. And you have these templates, multiple arguments, and you use the template to generate a lot of good code, presumably, right? You're with me? All right. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you get to use design patterns, uh, uh, policy-based design, to implement uh, very nicely a variety of design patterns. And uh, they even made it, I noticed recently, they made it in Wikipedia. So along with uh, 75 others, it's, uh, it's one of the program paradigms. And I'm, I'm mentioning 75 because 75 is a small number relative to like a lot of things in programming, uh, computer science. So it's, it's, a, set, it's a, a member of a small set. And my claim here is that design, you know, policy-based design should be re replaced with the next big thing, which is design by introspection. So in policy-based design, you turn the programmer into a fancy macro processor. So um, a member of the patterns community is known to have said that. And uh, that, first of all, like, this is a very exciting thing to talk about. Like when you see fancy macro processor, you're thinking, this is a line of business I want to be in. I want to do that. 
right? Where do I sign? So with policies, you get to fight combinatorics with combinatorics because you have all of these facilities that you want to implement, and they are so varied in, uh, in what you need, they need to handle and what they need to do, right? And then instead of writing traditionally yet another piece of software for each, you're going to reuse your own code base by combining them in different ways. So you get combinatorial effect from linear code. So that means to essentially compress your code. This is not very new, actually. Design with interfaces has the same property. Because, so let me kind of um, go even, even more back in history. Um, let's go back to 19, 1956. The good year 1956, right? Buddy Holly was up, that kind of stuff, right? You don't know Buddy Holly. Okay, rock, you know, rock legend. Anyway. I mean, I'm talking to the wrong audience right now. <laughs> okay, so, um, <clears throat> so 1956, uh, Fortran was invented, and we have Fortran, and there's a procedural programming style of doing things, and it was, you write code, for example, you write in Fortran, uh, you know, how to invert a matrix, or how to multiply matrices and whatnot, and then you would reuse that code. And it was a very clear uh, contract and equation you write code, and you use the code, and if it's a library, you get to reuse the code, and that was the, the contract. And then objects came about, which uh, kind of changed the equation fundamentally, because at that point, when you had the interfaces and indirect calls, V tables, right? At that point, you were reusing code that has not been written yet, right? Because you, use, you call through interfaces. You don't know what exactly they're going to do. So you reuse code that will be written later. And that was amazing. I mean, most people are like, oh my god, this is amazing. So I get, I get to, you know, I get this, this boost, this leverage and reuse, which is amazing. And sort of that's why object uh, technology is so successful, because you simply get to use interfaces and, you know, you implement them in various ways later. So that was amazing. There was one problem, though. With every more layer of interface you added, there was more friction, more indirection, more you know, indirect calls, more of that, more of that. So it was not that good. So then template solved that by saying, you know what, we're going to do all of this uh, reuse of code that has not been written yet. We're going to do it during compilation. And with that came other benefits, such as I can reuse types during compilation and that kind of stuff, type definitions. And you know, it made for a much uh, stronger way of reusing things. right? Uh, but um, templates are even more interesting than uh, simple mechanisms for code reuse because of the combinatorics effect. So whenever I have a template with multiple arguments, right, by, by the combination of those arguments de determine the behavior of the thing. And it's, there's no cost to it. There's no price. You just put them in and it just works because assembly is online. It's not through pointers and indirect calls and whatnot. So that's what makes really uh, this technology amazing, because actually what you're doing is pretty much you generate code that's specialized for a specific desire that you have, right? So fight combinatorics with combinatorics. Over the years, people have used policy-based design and stuff, and it was uh, has advantage, pluses and minuses. You know, it's it's kind of um, it has it is enjoying use. But then here's the here's the thought that catalyzes the whole thing. What would happen if we could arrange the atoms one by one the way we want them? You know who this guy is? Yes, by rounds of applause, please. <laughs> All right, thank you. <clears throat> My wife didn't. It was a bad moment for the family. <laughs> so Richard Feynman has said, you know, essentially he wrote a paper, he said, actually we don't, we don't break any laws of physics if you had hands that are small enough to just assemble the atoms as you wish. So you could create any substance you want, any alloy, any, you know, anything that you want, if you could simply just assemble the atoms and the molecule appropriately. And that paper launched a whole new scientific domain, which is? Which is? Nanotechnology. 
So this is the seminal paper of that launched nanotechnology, because nanotechnology is all about creating very small devices that assemble atoms and molecules and substances. We didn't get to the point of atoms and molecules, but we got to like some macro, you know, relatively macro things. So similarly, <clears throat> that's why I insist on under this quote. Similarly, how about there were a way to assemble a design by hand? by taking elements of design and putting them together, assembling them as you want, as opposed to policies which require quite a bit of uh, orchestration to make work, right? You know, with templates in each, oh, make sure you implement that side of the interface and that side, if you don't do that, you're wrong, you're wrong, and it's terrible, and it does, it's not quite orthogonal, and all, that, all those kind of issues that appear in policy-based design. But what if you get to actually implement all of these great things by hand. How do I mean that? Well, in patterns, design patterns, the programmer expands their own mental macros. So you know visitor, it's an intellectual process. You know the visitor pattern, you have the application in front of you that you want to use the visitor pattern with, and you sit down and you write the code. You with me? It's an intellectual process, it's a, it's a you know, it's a, Semi-creative process, right? Because you kind of know what you do, but it's, there's always a bit of difference in the context. So you implement the pattern from your head, from your mind. So you have total plus, you can do anything you want, any variation you want, but there's no reuse because you sit down and write the code online. In policy-based design, the programmer is going to assemble some macros, aka templates, that they are provided by the library writer. For example, there is a visitor library, and they implement a lot of the mechanics of the visitor design pattern, but there's always something that you know, is rigid and it doesn't work exactly how you want. Maybe you don't want to throw here, maybe you want to log something here, maybe you want a variation that doesn't exist, etc. So you have a bit of rigidity there that you don't like. Right? In design by introspection, the programmer molds macros that communicate with and adapt to each other because you get to open the components of design and introspect them and ask, can you do this, can you do that? In, the, in, in policy-based design, if a component doesn't have the right interface, that's an error, it's a compile time error, it doesn't compile. In design by introspection, you get to ask if they support a specific operation, if they don't, you can take an alternative step. It can do something else. It turns out this sort of graceful degradation is very, it happens very often if you look for it. So uh, here we have good plasticity and good code reuse, so you get to do pretty much what you want. Don't worry, I'll have examples. <clears throat> so we have a few prerequisites that the language must, uh, must implement in order to use this style of programming. So what would be the input to a design? You just shout. What, are the, what is the input to a design? Template. Template. Use case. It's, it's, it's somewhere in between. Uh, an, input, uh, an input to a design in, in the sort of large sense is in, indeed the use case, because you start with the use case and you build a design. But you want to build a design, you already know the use case. The input would be some artifact that you have, you know, so that some library component. Some component would be the input, right? And that comes in the form of code. And if you want to do introspection on that code, you need to have the ability to introspect those types. What are your methods? I'm, I mean, literally, you take a type you have no idea about. It comes from a header that you don't know. It comes from a friend. You include the header, you take the type, you know the name as a string, and you say, well, what, what, do you, what can you do? How can you improve my day right now? Right, so it, it's, a, it's, an, it's a query, it's a capability query. You know, what are your methods? What are your data members? What is, you know, how many gaps do you have in between the data members? Right, what's your layout? All of these questions in an introspection system are immediate and easy, right? 
a very, uh, a very uh, often used variant, uh, essentially I use this like maybe 80% of the time. The variant would be, do you support method XYZ? And notice XYZ is a string. It's not the result of some other introspection, it's a string, because I know the thing by name, and I say, do you know how to reallocate? Do you know the method reallocate? This allocator, does it have reallocate or not, etc. right? So do you support this particular method? I give it by string, the component says yes or no, and the most strong of these would be, does this code compile? You give like a, a essentially give any balanced parenthesis piece of code, as long as the parenthesis is balanced, you're good. That's an exaggeration. As long as it's syntactically valid, it's going to go inside the operator, does this compile? And you, you ask, does it compile? So the compiler is going to do everything. It's going to do name lookup. It's going to do uh, type checking. It's going to do semantic checking. It's going to do everything that you need to say yay or nay, the code compiles or not. But if it doesn't, that's not an error. It's, the result is false. You feel me? The result is I, I can't compile this, I'm sorry. And you say, oh, okay, if that doesn't compile, it means I'm gonna do something else. So imagine the power, but also the lack of structure of this extreme mechanism. By the way, this has been discussed before in the context of C++, and it kind of, people recognize the, the, the uh, this is kind of an interesting thing to, to allow, but they're also fearful because, oh my God, so many, you know, it's so dangerous because so many, it's so unstructured, so many things can be done with it. But actually, this would be a very good, I highly recommend, I highly recommend that there exists an operator in C++ that says, does this code compile? It works very well for C++. Does this code compile? DBI processing. You want to do arbitrary processing during compilation. And by arbitrary, I mean I need to be able to use new to create vectors, strings, trees, right? A a anything. I want to do arbitrary com com computation during compilation, right? I don't want to be limited. I don't want to call uh, the system function. Uh, I'm, I'm, okay, so you might be Germans and have a sense of humor and all, but I'm seeing you're not getting this. You know the system function, you can call any, anything, so you get this header from a friend. He says, oh, why don't you compile this for me? And it has like system remove, uh, you know, everything on your root drive and that kind of stuff. So that was the joke. It, zero success. Uh, this, I'm never going to use it again. Okay, so processing is I need to do arbitrary compile time evaluation. When I say arbitrary, is everything but system calls. Everything within the realm of C++ I should be able to do. Loops, iteration, you name it, I, I should be able to do. Allocate memory, create objects, hash tables, you name it, it should be there. And fortunately, I'm very happy to, to notice that C++ has gotten you know, quite a bit on that way. Maybe 30% of the way. They're already kind of making great progress with that. So that's very, uh, very hardening. And for output, you need to have a, you say, I'm gonna generate some code and I'm going to output it. And I think this has not been done very well as of right now. Uh, I think this side is uh, seriously lacking. And what I think would be very appropriate would be to simply generate arbitrary code in the form of strings and pass it to the compiler to say, compile the string. And when I say this is, well, that string may be a complicated processing, the result of a complicated processing. So it may be some really elaborate string that has generated some significant code, and then I'm going to pass it to the compiler. So all of these must be present for design by introspection to happen. Right? You can't, like, you can't have, like, you can't be almost pregnant. You can, ah, we have like a bit of that, uh, quite, quite a bit of that, and none of that. But, but we still still make it, right? No, you're not going to make the baby. Not going to make it. So you got to have all of these. Input, processing, output. Input is being proposed. Processing is work in progress. Output is non-existent. You got to have all of these. 
So let me talk a bit about uh, something that I discovered um, sort of by, uh, by happenstance while I was doing this kind of stuff. And I found it extremely useful and extremely interesting. Optional interfaces. So here's the thing. Traditionally, OK, let me go back and ask you a question. So first of all, uh, traditional interface-based design. Do you think the best interfaces are large or small? I hear a small, right? So good interface should be small, because large would put strain on, like, you need to implement a bunch of things and that kind of stuff, right? So the best interfaces are small in traditional design. I come back and say, in a design by introspection setting, interfaces are big. Uh, the, the bigger, the better, actually. The more you grow, the more it gets, the, the more awesome it is. I'm not kidding. But, and here's the beauty of it. In a design by introspection component, you prescribe a number of required primitives, which at the minimum can be zero. You may have no required primitive, and that makes for the small interface part. And a number of optional primitives, which the implementer of the interface may or may not choose to implement. They may go like, you know what, this particular interface, I, I, it's not within my capabilities. Consider allocators. Uh, some allocators should implement expand, like expand some memory in place, right? It's a nice primitive to have. You want to expand some memory. Some allocators just can't implement it. It's not within their capabilities. They allocate only fixed chunks, and they can't grow in place. So expand would be a great example of an allocator optional method, interface function, right? So then whenever you use the interface that you get, so first of all, you write a nice document saying, uh, here's my uh, interface design by contract. If you want to qualify, you need to implement these required methods and uh, zero more of these optional primitives, right? And now whenever you use the interface, you're going to do introspection. You're going to query for the optional methods. You're going to say, do you do that? And the interface says, yeah, I do that. Yeah, sure, have at it. So then you use it. Or maybe it says, no, it's not within. I can't do that. So then you say, well, if you can't expand in place, I'm going to reallocate in a different place, etc." Right? And one, uh, one interesting detail that I found was that what's missing is as important as what's present. So this kind of uh, another good quote, uh, Jens, by the way. What's missing is as important as what's there. Because what's missing is, is, is a bo it's a binary information. It's, uh, it's good entropy. It's I can't do that. And the fact that you can't is, it's a, is a decision. Right? So now you have up to two to the power of number of optional methods possible interfaces in a compact form. In one place, you get to define the power set of all possible interfaces that include those optional methods. Uh, how do I come about this number? Please shout, mathematicians in the crowd. How, it's the size of the power set, the set of all sets, right? The set of all subsets of a set. Did I say that right? Yeah. So the set of all possible subsets of a set is two to the, uh, to the number of elements in the set, right? So that's going to give you a huge number of possible interfaces, but you just need to specify it once, as opposed to specifying like an idiot one interface per method, right? That would be a lot of, you know, it would be just unpleasant to start with, and it would be a lot of overhead and a lot of issues there, right? But like that, you say, ah, this is, uh, you know, these are required, but this is optional. Um, in the allocator, so I wrote an allocator library that does this, this kind of stuff, and the allocator has one required method, and that's called allocate. I, you know, I made the pact with myself. I said, no allocator can refuse to allocate. <laughs> they should all know how to allocate memory. As far as freeing memory, there are allocators that don't know how to free memory. The, the bump the pointer, right? The fastest allocator doesn't know how to deallocate because it has no way, doesn't manage the holes. So that kind of stuff. So we have a very compact way of describing very large interfaces by means of combinatorics. So again, the keyword here is fight combinatorics with combinatorics. Great. So we have linear code for quite literal exponential behavior because we have that, uh, uh, that uh, equation there. 
And uh, that includes state variations too. So you get to do not only uh, interface, but you can say, well, it has to have a data member or whatnot. There's no penalty for large interfaces. You have graceful degradation. So whenever you, in the kind of, uh, in the old traditional approach, whenever you had interface that didn't implement uh, the, entire, uh, the entire specification, you're gonna have an error. But with the new thing you have, you may offer reduced features. Maybe uh, this, alloc this allocator doesn't reallocate or doesn't expand or doesn't free memory, etc. Remember when I told you that was the most difficult part of my talk in the beginning? I lied. This is the, hard, the most difficult part of this talk. If const expert, who knows about if const expert? Who thinks it's a great thing? All right, thank you. I think it needs a fix, an important fix. Consider this, it's taken from real code base. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work because it uses a construct that doesn't exist. Replace that mentally, that static if, with if const expert. Why does it not work? Shout. Why does it not work? Shout. Please? If, if uh, must be a function. No, this is fine. If const text, we should work with this expression. Sorry? Max length is not known during compilation. It is. Actually, it's, uh, if it's a template parameter, you can use it during, you can read it during compilation. Why does it not work with if const text per? Shout, the lo really loud. Scope. Scope, thank you. It doesn't work because of this one character. You see the hand there? It doesn't work because this one character introduces a scope with if const expert. Therefore, anything that happens after static if is confined within that scope. So you define that using, which introduces a type that depending on the static if is good. After the static if and else are done, at this point, the compiler is like, cell IDX? I never heard of that. I have no idea. What are you talking about? So st if const expert introduces a scope, which is a grave mistake. It's actually so bad that I would say that makes if const expert next to unusable for anything that's interesting. You can use it for non-interesting things. I give, I give it that. You can use it for crap. That's great. It works great for crap. It does not work for anything that's interesting. I'm not kidding. For anything that, when I was like, huh, that, that, oh, wait, it doesn't work. It does not work. How many lines do you think you would need to do this with traditional C++ with, you know, because of that rule? So uh, just to recap here, we have a hash table, and uh, it defines, depending on the length, it defines the, you know, the, the type of the cell uh, index. And then it has another static if, which is going to define the, you know, the key uh, value structure depending on, that's the continuation, uh, depending on the size and the alignment of the data involved. So that's very nice. By the way, aligners, uh, yeah, yeah, it didn't come out uh, uh, bright blue because I need to update LaTeX or whatever. But um, yeah, I use LaTeX for, this is pathetic, right? <laughs> this is not PowerPoint. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. So um, anyway, so uh, the idea is you have here how many possible layouts? How many possible layouts do I have with these two uh, decision points in the design? Four. I thought you said two. You know the joke with a, you know, maybe there's a Roman guy and said five, you know? <laughs> so there's four designs. Do you have four layouts? And in what a compact form, you simply just make the decisions as you go along, as if you program like runtime. It's like if, oh yeah, if the size is that, I'm gonna use a small integer, and others I'm gonna use a big integer. What's the big deal? Right? This is amazing how, how it works. To do this without this facility, 
you need like four times the code. Or you need the library that's eight times the code. Like Boost must, you know, probably they have something for that. That was a, another joke that only guy got it. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> So you get to express very, um, very varied designs combinatorially with very little means, very few lines of code. You just simply just go there. And what I think people don't really kind of, it has not been internalized by the people doing this, is if constexpert, or you know, aka like static, if constexpert done right, it does not operate at runtime. And they were like, sure, of course, what's your point? But my point is, it does not even operate at compile time. Because at compile time, if you have an if inside the uh, const expert function that you evaluate, yes, that if is going to be evaluated during compilation. And it's a completely different deal. It's an if, it's a regular if evaluated during compilation. But it remains a regular if. And scopes are a construct that, have, that deals with Compilation and with runtime, it has semantics and it has, you know, it has these like I'm gonna limit the boundaries here. <clears throat> Regular if inside const expert is, is is if is completely different from what you what you need. If const expert should operate at design time. Design time, it's. Let me put it this way. You know when you make mentally, you, you design, you write code, and you make decisions? Oh, you know, this component doesn't do that, or you know, that I know how to do that or that. So you make decisions of design. And what ends up in the, your editor is one of them, is one path taken. You see what I'm saying? Is, is one decision that you made, and that's gonna be enshrined in the text of the program. But with if const expert plus plus, <laughs> Right? With if context plus plus, you get to write both. You get to write two decisions that you make for your design. And that's amazing. It's amazing that you get to say, well, if, uh, you know, whatever this happens, I'm going to go with this design. But otherwise, I'm going to go with another design. And both end up in our editor. They're both viable. They're both there working. They're both realizable. Ah, thank you, yeah, the, the golf clap, I got a bit of a, I confess, when I, when I get to like a very interesting point, my, the hair in my, on my head, I feel it stiff. I'm not kidding, this is not a joke. So I'm, I feel my hair like, uh, right now I felt that, just before the golf clap, which destroyed, ruined the, that whole thing. <laughs> so, but you know, this is what happens. This, it's a completely different space. It's the Fourier transfer, it's not in time, it's not compilation, it's before all, all that, it's in, uh, platonic space. It's the idea space, because depending on the, the, what's happening, I may have two different ideas. The traditional way of writing code is I, have, I go with one idea out of many. In this case, I could go with as many ideas as I have. This is what's amazing about it. And I'm sure the, the person who golf clapped, I think they, they had the same feeling, of, oh yeah, this is something, this, there's something in there, right? So it operates at design time, and you get to actually write down on paper, on, you know, on, in your editor, you get to write down your thought process. So that makes the whole scope thing, is just, it's a joke. It's if const expert, as it is right now, is the cargo cult version of static if. No golf club right now, huh? Do you see the silence? All right. So it's really like terrible that the, you know, they got this close to having a good idea. They got this, if only. So please, fix it. Fix the damn thing. Okay? You see how big the tension is right now in this room? You feel it? Like, it got very tense all of a sudden. I told you, this is the hardest part of my talk. So it makes all the difference that you have a construct that operates during design. So each use of if const expert plus plus, if you wish, sort of the would be version of if const expert, could double the design space covered. It would just essentially, every, every time you do an if, it's like, remember, like, you know, fork in Unix, fork? Like, whenever if, static if is fork in design space. 
I mean, just, you know, you just have that. You, can't, you could have it. You could have it if you just convince the right people. But we don't have it. Right? You got to have it. It must not introduce a scope. The sheer fact that the, the whole scope thing came about is a complete, it's a huge confusion. It's like, oh, wait, so we have these scopes and we have this. If you want a scope, you can actually always add a second curly. You, you see what I'm saying? You can easily add a new scope. You can get, get rid of a scope with the, with the ifcast expert. So you can easily say curly brace and another curly brace, and that's, that means you do want to introduce a scope. So you're not barred from introducing scopes. And guess what? In the D language, there is such a construct, and whenever you need to add a new scope, you do that idiom. And that would be 4% of all cases. So in 4% of all cases, you do need the extra scope. In 96% of the cases, you're just, you just want no scope there. So must not introduce a scope, friends. Must not, int please, talk to your governor. <laughs> okay, call Angela Merkel, call somebody. Okay? <laughs> Call somebody about it. Design by introspection examples. So there are a few realized examples. They are in another language. <laughs> another language. Okay? So there exists experience with, uh, with design by introspection in another language. You can just Google for another language and find it. So uh, there will be uh, an allocator in the standard library of another language, uh, which is an unbounded uh, allocator's design in 12,000 lines of code. 12,000 lines of code is, uh, sounds like a you know, solid code base, but it's actually, um, you know, you can design any allocator you want. It has like a variety of possible allocators, custom, non-custom, and to compare, JMalloc, a high-performance allocator, is one allocator implemented in a C language in traditional manner, and it's 45,000 uh, lines of code. And the allocator that, uh, uh, that I'm talking about, the, the 12,000 lines, uh, lines of code, implements JMalloc along with an infinity of other allocators. <laughs> I, I mean, it's unbounded, quite literally, it's unbounded, because you can, you know, you can add always new, new components. So that would be a great design, and most of uh, what it does is it simply uh, it just uh, in, you know inspects things like do, do you, you know you have allocator components and the, the only thing that uh, the allocator does is it inspects things by means of static if collections. There's a work in progress. I'm not going to talk uh, too much about it because it's not done. But collections are an amazing source of design by introspection. It's just like the right place. Um, who's familiar with Bloom filters, by the way? Bloom filters. So the Bloom filter is an interesting hash table because it has, um, you know, it, you, you know, it's like a hash table, but it doesn't have like a find. It has uh, almost sure or definitely not. These are the primitives. So a key is almost surely in there, or if it returns false, it's definitely not in there. So if you get a true, it's like maybe, right? So it's like in politics, no is maybe, etc. Right? Whatever. So um, the the Bloom filter is an example of a non conventional container, which is almost a container, but is not quite. And, you know, it has a number of interesting, unique characteristics. And doing this kind of Bloom filter, which is an unusual container in a traditional, I have a containers library, is very dif difficult, because it's hard to use alongside with other containers. But with design by introspection, you just implement these uh, weird methods, and you, know, you specify them as optional methods for the others. And who doesn't want to implement it? It's not going to. And now we're going to talk about uh, std experimental checked int. We're going to talk about the checked int class, which is the simplest thing that you can think of. Um, <clears throat> welcome to my talk about checked integrals. It is very short. So the only things you need to be uh, worried about is R. Uh, plus may overflow, plus equal, you know, minus, minus equal, plus, plus. All of these operators may lose information by means of overflowing, right, or underflowing, whatever. And you have division by zero, of course, but that's going to kind of just hold the system. Um, also, there's an obscure one, which is negating the most negative is negative, right? 
You know about this? Like if you take minus on int, usually it gives you a positive number. But if there's one int that doesn't want to do that. It's the smallest, the most negative integer. When you negate that guy, it's the same guy. So that's actually a known problem. So you know, whenever you do operations and you say, oh, if it's negative, make it uh, x equals minus x and it's going to be positive. No, it's not going to. Right? So that's, a, that's an obscure problem. But you know, the funny thing is that's pretty much it. That kind of ends the realm, the universe of checked integers. Everything we need is here. These are the things you need to look for. So now, well, <clears throat> well we have these, um, uh, these challenges. You know, what do you check? Are you going to check the overflows, division by zero, negation, mixed sign comparisons, conversion, some of the above, which ones? On violation, what you're going to do, you know, so there are so many choices that you can make about any possible library. And the challenge here is to make it a small library, because you do want proportional response. You don't, check, checked integers don't do anything. It's like, you know, remember my joke about optional? It's the same thing. Checked integers, they don't do work. You get my drift? Like, there's a lot of code that you know is there, but doesn't kind of work. It's not, it doesn't do uh, interesting computation, but it's there for scaffolding for support purposes. It's a cheerleading team, right? So that's where checked in comes. It doesn't do anything really interesting. So you want to make it small, proportional response. Ah, here I have a small library for checked integers and etc. Now we get to a problem because if you want to make this into something that is generic in the library, now you have compounded difficulties. You're looking at a completely different issue right now. Because you shouldn't have a difficulty implementing any given behavior, so by, you know, you just take a spec and you, you implement it. But it's much more difficult to allow behaviors that are not yet specified, and that's going to uh, make problems. Because um, I'm sure many of us know from uh, designing C++ libraries that when you show to somebody a highly generic library for a, for a relatively trivial um, um, thing, you know, for a relatively trivial uh, task, they're going to be like, oh, you mean I need to read all of these 5,000 lines of crap you wrote? You know what? I'm not going to. I'm just going to do it by hand. And they're not doing it, so they're not going to do it. And actually, I, tr I try to, just for the sake of um, demonstration, I try to check by hand integer operations. And you know, after you've done like 10 of those, you, for, you don't know what the algorithm is doing anymore. Because a function that was like five lines becomes like 25 lines of checks and ridiculous things. It's like you forget what the algorithm was, right? So uh, that's definitely a problem. <clears throat> And to wit, uh, I've been looking at a number of baselines in the C++ domain uh, for these kind of libraries. And of course, you, get the, you, can, you can picture the class right now. It has all of the operators, and it has all of the checks, and it has all of the stuff. So uh, Mozilla has a checked in for C++, which is short. It's 800 lines of code. But it doesn't have docs or unit tests in, within that. So it's just the code is uh, 800 lines. But that's about the only good thing I can say about it. It's the only good thing. So they're going to store a Boolean with each number, which tells you whether it's good or not. So you actually, it's a kind of a inefficient approach. It's a valid approach, but it's not good for everybody. right? So it's very specific that way. So it's going to have like each integer is going to be actually two integers and et cetera. Um, it, uh, it lets the user do the enforcement, so you still need to check a lot of, uh, a lot of things. It doesn't have any configuration and has a <laughs> very inefficient approach, uh, which is very funny because um, the checks are separated from the operations. So that sounds like a good principle, right? But think of this. Um, if you want to separate checks from operations, whenever you do a division, how do you check the division that the division worked? Well, you do, that, you do the multiplication back, and you see if you get the same number. I'm not sure I'm conveying the message. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a type that is supposed to be used in a lot of code, and is supposed to be highly efficient in checking the integers. And is, are, you, are you telling me this is the best way you can go? You check the, the division by means of a multiplication? 
Don't you? Is there a flag in the CPU you can actually use? Actually, there is, but you know. But there's so many other good things you can do, even without assembler and stuff. There's so many, like if the integers are small enough, if they're like within 16 bits and everything. So there's so many things you can do before saying, oh, yeah, I know how to check division. I'm going to multiply the thing back, which is ridiculous. So anyway, so that would be uh, the kind of a small scale, but kind of really bad. Uh, but let's go to the other uh, uh, end of the spectrum here. And we have 7,000 lines of code. That would be just the code. Because the documentation is much bigger. For documentation, you, you, need, a, you need a Blu-ray. <laughs> it doesn't fit on DVDs. And the Blu-ray, MSDM Blu-ray, counts at the price, and you got to buy it to get the documentation. It's this big. It's the Death Star of checked integers. <laughs> OK? It's like, oh my god, if they wanted to do a check, this, they, they did the crap out of that checked integer, my god. It's amazing. So they, they, everything you can think about, I think, I, I think the whole company put a shoulder in there. It's so big and so you know, elaborate. I think Steve Ballmer contributed some code to that. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Developers, developers, right? So this would be sort of the extreme skiing version of, uh, of uh, say, Fint. It does pretty much anything you can imagine. I think it has an AI, AI module too. Anyway, so um, moving forward, we have saved numerics for C++. It's a traditional policy-based design, which is 5,000 lines. 5,000 lines. And we have a, a, another language uh, checked in type, which is another traditional policy-based design, again, within 5,000 lines. But to this credit, it includes uh, the docs as well, so it's much more compact. So now. For a checked integer, I have a question for everybody. Um, how, how big would be a library that you would accept for this kind of stuff? How many lines would you accept? Shout. 1,000. I got two people saying 1,000. Thank you. Because that's my budget. I said, you know what? I'm going to do it in 1,000 lines. If it's much beyond 1,000 lines, it's not worth it. And I said, 1,000 lines would be my budget for code. So I sat down and wrote it. And I got a bit over budget, but that shouldn't be a surprise. This is programming after all. <laughs> right? Come on. But uh, well, I saved from tests. I have fewer tests. So yeah, I saved in other places. So I have, <laughs> yeah, that was a <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> That was a bit more subtle than I even, than I even expected. So um, we have 3,000 lines of code in total within the same file that includes the whole code, the documentation, and the unit tests. So everything is in one file, and it's a compact file, and it's a very compact thing, and it just works. And the speed I measured is comparable to hand instead of checks. It doesn't do all the ridiculous things that uh, others are doing. And the flexibility, that's the important part, is really unbounded. So you can insert, you know, you can add your own checks and whatever, and anything you want. So the overall design is quite simple. It has a shells with hook, shell with hooks approach. I'm going to have the, the code in a second. Um, and it's similar to policy-based design, but it's much more compact because it's driven by introspection. The shell is going to do all the nonsense with operators and you know operator bool, you know test for if and all of these like language specific things. And the hooks are going to be you know are going to be observers on the events that happen whenever you uh, you do the wrong thing. And the do the default hook is just going to abort on anything that that looks bad. So here's the design. So we have a template of uh, this would be my integer, integral type, and that would be my my hook. It only has one parameter, because you can compo compose the parameters by building a hook on top of another. So um, we're going to have the payload, which is private, so we protect it that way here. And here, yet another static if. And here's like, uh, this is an interesting trick. So most hooks have no state. And you don't want the state to be reflected in the size of the checked integer, right? So you want to, if it's checked into of an int, it should be 32 bits and not more. But you know the problem with empty base optimization, all that stuff, right? So if you insert a hook as a member, you need to kind of, uh, it needs to occupy some space and whatnot. But uh, static if comes to the rescue because you can say static if state size of hook greater than zero, so it has some state. 
then I'm going to define a hook, and otherwise I'm going to define a static hook. And then in the rest of the code, I just use hook with lowercase, and it just works. Because if it's a static member, it knows, the compiler knows what to do, right? Uh, by the way, how would you implement state, state size based on introspection? State size. Size of is not state size. Size of of anything cannot be zero. So size of doesn't work. This is the interesting detail that I wanted to convey, right? So state size, it, it has some meaningful state. How do you check for that with introspection? Imagine you can ask anything. Ask me anything about this type. Thank you. Enumerate the members. Does the set have size zero? Then it has no state. Done. Enumerate all members. And actually, that's a library function that does exactly that, right? So enumerate the members. If the, the set of all members has zero, uh, when I say members, data, direct data members. So there is a primitive for introspecting that particular aspect. So then, you know, if the state size is zero, etc. So um, then, when you use Introspection, you put, as I said, you put in the shell all, all, everything that's common, and uh, it has the qualifiers, const, and whatnot, uh, all of the, you know, everything that's uh, language specific and has nothing to do with the integers, you're going to do in the shell. And it's going to do the, the type system integration, the driving the hooks, and mediation of composition. What if you have two hooks that are interested in the same event? You know, maybe you have two overflow hooks. I'll explain in a second what you can do here. And you use introspection to look at the hooks. What can you do? What operations are you interested in? And guess what? I just measured last night. There is one static if every 10.52 lines. Like in the code base, every 10 lines, there's going to be a static if. Imagine just how many customization points you have there, how many possible designs are in that 1,000 lines of code. And by the way, there are as many static ifs as ifs. I thought it was going to be have more effect on you guys. But. <laughs> so there like, there's like this many, and there's like one if for 10 lines. So a bit more frequent, but just about in the same, the same range. Uh, let me show you just for a second. I'm, I know this is a, a, a different language, but I'm sure you can squint a bit and um, see what I'm talking about. All right. Magnify. Well, big is the topic of the stock, right? Uh, do, you, do you guys see any? In the, oh, in the back you have more monitors, right? Can you see it? I want a hand from the back to tell me you can see the code. Thank you. All right, so what we have here is uh, it's a grep. It's, uh, let me actually run the grep again. So it's a graph for static if within uh, this particular uh, code base. And these are the queries that I make. If it has the member, if the hook has the, the, if this hook type has the member default value, and notice how I introspect it by a string. I'm asking, do you have the string, you know, this name, I'm passing you the name of the method as a string. This is like true introspection. I know nothing from ahead of time about the type. I just, I know a string, I know a name. It should be there. Do you have this default value? Do you have the state size? Look at the state size there. I'm going to try this. I don't think it's going to work. Oh, it, will. it does. OK. So um, I asked, the, give me the state size of the hook. Is it greater than? Uh, does he have a member? Does he have a member? Is it an integral? Does he have a member? You know, comparison direct for types, et cetera. Is uh, the value convertible? Does it have a member, et cetera? Most of them are of this type. Has member hook hook up CMP. Uh, replace mentally the, the bang with the, you know, the, the, the angle brackets, and you're going to have the C++ translation thereof, right? So these are tests that are occurring. And by the way, I wasn't lying. So you see there's like 114 um, lines in 1,000 lines of code. Uh, in 1,000 plus, so there's a bit more. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the basic idea here. We have all of these introspection tests. And uh, just to kind of, as, by the way, let me ask you a question. Question for everybody. If you put void for hook, what do you get? Int. 
That's your ping. This is your check that everything works. You put void in there, and actually there's an unit test that does exactly that. If you instantiate checked in with int and void, you should get something that is as good and as fast as int, because it's a hook that does nothing and has no state. Has no interest in your hobby, has no state, it's just there, void, does nothing. So this would be the, you know, the, the most basic unit as you can imagine is if I have the hook that does nothing, that would be my null hook. So it, indeed, that would be a, that's an interesting artifact. So you have the, the default hook does nothing, so it just works like an int. So that's a, that's a test that you have. And then we have a number of defined hooks. Um, there's a hook, this, this is the default hook. Whenever something bad happens, it just aborts the application with a message. Throw, obviously, is going to throw exceptions whenever something bad happens. Warn is going to output issues to standard error. And we have two more that are very interesting. We have a hook that adds a NAND state for integers. You have, I mean, it's an option, right? So you say, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice. You know, you know how I'm going to sacrifice that jerk, the, the smallest, the most negative integer. That's a jerk because it has that weird property. Right? So I'm going to sacrifice that guy. That's going to be my null value. The hell with him, right? So I'm going to sacrifice that guy. That's going to be my nan. And you can design a hook that does that. Right? And it's not too difficult, actually. But it's a remarkable, it's a remarkable thing to, uh, to be able to integrate. And we have saturate, which is just as interesting. Whenever you have something that would overflow, you just saturate to the maximum value and you stay there. And that may actually be very useful in a, quite a number of, uh, of applications. So you have the hook that saturates. And guess what? You can define your own, of course. But my point is the average length is 50 lines of code. So you can actually define a meaningful hook in, on a page. And this is sort of the proof of concept that design by introspection work, works, right? Great. So, design by introspection. You get to assemble things by looking at them, by adapting to them, by doing whatever, you know, whatever I can do, you're going to adapt to it. And it's easy because you have all of these introspection tests, you have the qu capability queries, you ask uh, components, what can you do, what can't you do? Combine. If cast expert plus plus. Yes? Yes? Yes. 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 <laughs> Combine compile time introspection with compile time evaluation and with code generation, and you're going to be there. Last but not least, vaccines cause autism. I'm like that crazy guy in the, the background who's like you know, in an interview or whatever, the people on the street, the guy with the panel, like, vaccines cause autism, you know? And I, like that guy, I'm saying, actually, that, was, that guy is wrong, but I think I'm right in saying, fix the goddamn if const expert. If, you, if, if there's any humanity in you, please do something. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a microphone in here for questions, if you have any. Oh, no question, okay. Yes, uh, I think you need to come or so what's the protocol, Jens? Yeah, to the microphone. <clears throat> Actually, I have a, a question about, uh, you know, lines of codes, how you measure that with different languages. <clears throat> you could have like a factor for each language, so, because not every language is as dense as, and of course, if you, if you place uh, like curly lines somewhere else, you get more lines, or if you have the braces somewhere else. Right. So is there some standard to kind of compare languages based on the line of which recognizes this? Excellent. Um, so let me repeat uh, the, uh, I know I'm not supposed to repeat if it's on the microphone, but I'm going to repeat to make sure I understand. So the question was, uh, is there some constant factor that uh, gets uh, from one language to another? Because some languages are high level, so you get to express more in less code. Was that it? And some languages are lower level, so the, it turns out, no. It turns out the, the rate of bugs is 
uh, dependent more on the team than the language and more of the methodology than the language. For example, NASA uh, holds the record of having zero bugs in half a million lines of code. But each line of code costs $2,000. You see, so it, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, something to be said about that. But it turns out uh, with high level languages, it does, you don't get fewer bugs, which is a, a kind of an interesting detail. Yes, please. Hi, so there was a lot of uh, very interesting theoretical content in this talk, but I have a very small practical question, which is for the with NAN hook. Uh, you mentioned that you are going to use the uh, minimum integer as a sort of safeguard value or NAND value. Does that mean that your useful set is now one smaller, so you have to adapt the checks as well? So now if you have the minimum number plus one and minus one, it becomes a negative value. Are the <coughs> checks changed as well? Yes, that's a great point. Thank you very much for asking. So let me show you um, uh, how we address that. Um, I don't have my glasses, so that makes it. Um, the the hook has uh, hook this hook that uh, give me just one second okay so the top line there is a hook op unary so hook has the option to let the let the uh, the shell do all the work or it has the op the option to hook the entire operation so in that case if the hook defines this particular uh, member function then uh, the the shell understands that they want to take over the operation entirely, and then the hook does the right thing. It's kind of does all the adjustments and everything. So indeed, the hook has the option to say, you know what, I don't want it to do A plus B. I don't want it to do by default. Just I do a special uh, little operation for that. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I have a related question. I mean, this slide just was great for my question, the one that you just took oh, away. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it, uh, it looks like. If I, so I have to provide the hook and I have to implement something like on overflow or I don't know, default value. And what if I spell it, misspell it? How is, how is this library helping me finding these errors? Because this looks like I'm essentially debugging Python code in the end. Right? Yes, it's a very good question, thank you. Actually, I shouldn't kind of, all are good questions. So this is, I'm, I'm glad you asked because there's a point to be made here. Um, so indeed, it is very true that if you misspell a string in here, um, it, you know, it's a bug that's, that becomes difficult to, to find by traditional means. No, but I mean misspell it in my hook when I write it, right? I call my member default value with an underscore. Right. For right. right. So you write the hook, and it doesn't, you know, uh, unit tests are supposed to solve that issue. So you're not supposed to, and actually I have a little beef with that, which I'm not sure we have the time for it. But essentially, um, my point is if you write some code, you need to write enough tests to make sure that the code is covered. Right? So you know, there's all the GCC and, uh, and Clang have this, this option to add uh, coverage reports for your, your unit tests and your code. So whenever you run unit tests, you must be sure that you have coverage of your code. And if you misspell the hook name, which is, it could happen. It did happen. So there is experience with that. Uh, if you misspell a hook, that hook code is not going to be covered. It's not going to do what you expect it to do, and uh, it's going to fail the unit test. Uh, but it is a very uh, legitimate. Uh, it's a very legitimate thing to worry about. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, so you talked about the three steps of uh, the introspection-based design, so the introspection, the evaluation, and the output generation? Yes. And for the output generation, you propose using a, a simple string which is given to the compiler. And yes. And recent developments of the standards show that the standards is uh, looking in another direction. As we saw in the talk of Louis Dion uh, this year in CVPCon, where we saw the unreflexible and reflexible keywords with these met meta types, which are the output of the operations. And mm -hmm. what do you think about this approach? <clears throat> um, I think um, I think reflexper is um, of marginal use, use usefulness. First of all, uh, I think most of the time what you want with introspection is not to reflect on something that exists. You want to query something that you don't know whether it exists or not. Notice that most of my design is pretty much, can you do that? Do you know how to jump or you know, do you know how to do X, Y, or Z? 
This is the, the fundamental introspection question. Reflex for is, you know, let me think about something that I know I wrote. Well, if you wrote it, you suppose you already thought of it. So Reflex for takes an ID that exists. No, I want to do query on some, you can't do that with, what, with the reflection proposal, but it's amazing that you get to read 75% of the damn proposal, and they mention it, it's like a footnote somewhere. Oh, actually, you could query with a string too. Thank God they didn't forget about that. It's almost the, the nightmare of if const expert, right? So um, I, I think uh, this, this, whole, um, uh, this, this whole direction of ref, reflex expert and unreflex expert and stuff is missing the point and is coming from somebody whose purpose was to automate a little boilerplate. And what I want is everything. And by the way, I want to pay nothing for it, but I want everything. You see, if somebody comes and says, I want to do this one little thing, it means that everything extra is by happenstance, which is actually what happened to templates. Templates were a little thing, and they became a big thing because, well, it just so happened. But I don't want a design to start with the little thing and the greater things ha happens just because it just so happened. But I want people to think about these, uh, th these, uh, these, these promises of design by introspection when they actually design the whole thing. And by the way, I'll have one more thing to say. Um, the output, you know, you want to generate arbitrary code, and there's, a, there's you know, there's an idea of using uh, this kind of um, complicated AST trees. You know, so you generate ASTs and you have, a, you know, the structure to things. And I say, you know what, strings are good. Because I, you know, I, I don't know 10 people who are experts in AST. I don't know 10 people who are experts in AST. And I know exactly, like, I, I know one guy who knows how to do, like, list macros and that kind of stuff. Right, the, the, of the structure kind. So, you know, strings, I, everybody in this room can do strings. Everybody knows how to do string manipulation, right? Concatenation and search and what, you know, kind of string, simple string manipulation. So I think strings are an effective way to go about things. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Um, hi, Andre. Um, you just answered my question, but let me push it a bit more. Please. Because I'm interested in the co-generative part of this theme, and you did briefly mention it when you said that we can <coughs> generate strings and ask the compiler to compile them for us. But compile times still are a big problem um, in, in C++. So, uh, but they're also verbose because they're human readables. Sometimes it, it would be easier if we could work with something like ASTs. Uh, and, okay, as you say, most of us don't know mostly anything about them, but we could learn, just as we learned about metaprogramming. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd expect that the, it would be a lot easier for the compiler to compile its own intermediate representation, like an AST, than to right. parse strings, which we generate also at compile time. So, right. yeah, it, I, it, whether you consider that option also. Yeah, I totally agree. So um, there's an issue here, which is a lack of efficiency. So if you generate code as strings, and then you pass the string back to the compiler, so there's clearly some kind of missteps in there, right? There's a, there's a bit of inefficiency, because why don't you generate the code which you know what you want to generate? Why don't you generate it as C++ tokens and ASTs and fragments and such? And uh, I think that's a good point. Um, I, I still think uh, dealing with strings is, uh, is a viable proposition because the reasons for C++ being slow are not as much um, uh, so parsing, the, you know, parsing the input. I think it's uh, actually C++ I think is doing an amazing job at parsing the input. Um, consider Hello World. You know, it has like 22 megabytes, right? Yeah, the source code. You know, it has 22 megabytes. Did you know that? So by the time you include that thing, it just expands to the fact that the whole 22 megabytes compiles and links in like 0.6 seconds is an amazing feat of technology. Like I think this is like peak humankind. We get to compile Hello World under a second, even if you have 22 megabytes of code, 
right? This is like peak humankind. We're just a me- We should wake up every morning, test it, and say, oh, my God, this is a good day. <laughs> right? So um, I think C++ is a great technology for, uh, for parsing and compiling. So I think there's issues with the user and whatnot. Uh, but let me make a, a secondary point, which is the following. Consider this. Consider you want to take a regular expression in regex format as a string and build an automaton that understands that particular regex, right? So if it's, uh, you know regex, right? Yeah, I know, to, yeah, to your demise, I know, yeah, and to mine too. So regex like say a dot star. So it would be any string that starts with an a and has any number of characters after a. So that would be a very easy recognizer to build, or a dot star b, that would be very easy to recognize. But now consider this, the regex source uh, the code of the regex comes in a very simple format. It's, um, you know, it's just c- complete non-C++. So then what would be easier to take the string, parse the string, generate the automaton as a string, and output the string, and p- compile the string, or take the string, mold it into a weird DST, and output the DST and all that. So I think it would be just, uh, significantly easier to deal with strings. Uh, from the same category, consider embedded SQL. Select field from whatever, join, whatnot, right? So you want to generate during compilation a parser for SQL. I am not kidding. I am not kidding. You want to generate during compilation a parser for SQL, run it during compilation because you have embedded SQL in your code, like link style. Run, run the parser you just compiled during compilation. Okay, this is complicated. I know. It kind of makes my mind. So you write the parser that compiles the grammar of SQL during compilation, understands the grammar of SQL during compilation, builds the parser during compilation, and then runs the resulting compiler during compilation. Okay, this has been done, by the way, in another language. Yes, please. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. And uh, I have a question about uh, optional interfaces. That's a great thing, but every time there is something is optional, there is another thing appears, it's versioning. So that, that is what? Version. Version. Yeah, version of interface. And uh, sometimes you may <coughs> want to have several versions in your library to not deliver new binary every time. So do you think it will be a problem for uh, this language, <laughs> uh, and uh, if it's a problem, do you see how it can be solved to make it easier and don't mm-hmm. produce any conflicts and problem like we have before with COM or everything? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so versioning for interfaces and for uh, introspection. Um, I think it's uh, relatively easy to do versioning. So first of all, like, I didn't think of this, so I'll be very honest. I didn't think of this, and I think it's somewhat of an orthogonal issue. But nevertheless, kind of these are my, you know, 20 seconds uh, thoughts. Um, I think with version, it's kind of easy to, uh, if you have version, if you want to provide for version, you can uh, you can do this in naming conventions like U, U O P N R V2 and that kind of stuff, and that's uh, actually feasible, even though it, lo- it looks ugly. But I think it's feasible because these hook names are internal only; they're not used by clients. They're used. In, they're a convention between the hook and the host, right? So it's not too difficult to have a, a scheme there. But that's pretty much where it stops. And I think it's, uh, it would be an interesting uh, thing to think about. Thanks for asking. Uh, hi. I have a question about the other language. Um, the static if, does this not add a scope? It does not add a scope. That is correct. It, it, just, it just looks like. It just looks like it, uh, the braces are present and they're necessary for, um, for um, delimitating the static if and the else. And um, uh, however, they do not introduce a scope. If you want a scope, you need a, another set, which I told you is rare. And um, there's one more detail. Static if in the other language is not, um, it's not a statement, it's a declaration. Okay. So you can occur at top level. It can occur at um, kind of actually in C plus plus some you know in some at some levels it can appear too, but it's uh, it's sold as a statement which is not it's not a statement so it needs to be a declaration so you can put it anywhere a declaration may uh, may occur. Um, 
And, you know, um, so, yeah, so this is the, the situation. I think, uh, I think there's, a, there's a clear issue with if Textor right now that, um, that drastically limits its capabilities, as I said. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Andre. Uh, Hello. Thanks for the very inspiring uh, topic. I was wondering about one particular point you made about um, the unbounded flexibility that design by introspection enables. My question is, how do, you don't need to go to there. Sure. Um, my question is, how do you test an implementation of a design with an unbounded design space? How do you test? Oh, wow. Yeah, I get all the good questions. It's like, as if you paid all of these, these folks. Um, so how do you test all of these unbounded possibilities, right? And I think that's an amazing question because um, each, each methodology brings a new testing method with it. Consider this, Fortran, you know, re remember the discussion we had, Fortran and all that stuff. How do you test a Fortran library? Well, you write some units for the Fortran library and you're done. And then when objects came about, when object technology with interfaces came about and inheritance and all that, um, there, there, actually, I'm not sure like everybody in this room is as old as I am, but because I remember distinctly there was a, an, um, a part of the community that said, you know what, this is, this is a disaster because we can't test this thing. How can you test something that uses code that is going to be written later? Right? So, uh, you know, it, it made no sense. Uh, imagine you, your mindset is completely set on, I have a routine for multiplying two matrices, I know how to test it. And you get to, I have a routine that calls through indirect pointers functions, and it could do whatever the hell it wants on this world. Right? It's a completely different paradigm for testing. So, um, what, ha what happened was you got to use object technology for testing. So you're going to use unit tests, and you're going to use interfaces implementations, and um, what's the name? Um, uh, mock, you know, mock classes, and all of these uh, techniques appeared uh, motivated by the fact that, indeed, there's a different methodology for testing a different methodology of writing code. Therefore, how are you going to fight uh, this issue that we have unbounded capabilities and can do anything, but how do you test anything? Well, you're going to... Oh, sorry, wait, wait. So, I have, I have a point to make. You're going to test using the same techniques. You're going to find, you're going to fight the possible combinatorics of generating code with combinatorics of unit testing technology. So actually, a lot of tests in the D language are, uh, they use uh, a list of types and the list of hooks, and they use the Cartesian product, and you're going to test like a, a bunch of things. And sometimes it actually can take a long time, to be honest. Like really, if you test like combinations like three, and you have each has like five, you're going to test a vast number of cases. But yeah, uh, the answer is use the same technology that you use for writing code to fight the, the, the bugs for testing. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, thank you for talk. Uh, so <coughs> you try to argue that the scope for static ifs or const ifs are, is not needed. But all the examples were very simple. So we just check whether we have max length less than uh, 60,000 and then use only 16 bits for this. But what if once the condition is met, we need to do some computation, some actual work during compile time that will need some local variables, cons uh, compile time, and maybe compile time aliases that we don't want to pollute the outer space. So to repeat the question, um, what if you do want the actual scope that uh, if context for adds, um, what do you do? And as I explained, actually, it's very easy to add a new scope. You just use, actually, I'll make grab for that, and I'll show you in a second. Okay. Okay. So I'm not sure if it's in this particular piece of code, but I'm going to grab for it. Uh, do you guys see it? Do you folks see it? Uh, I'm going to grab for two bra opening braces. I don't have my glasses, so I'm, uh, did I write it right? <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, so this is not nothing. Okay, let me uh, try, uh, I don't know, um, um, this guy, star, star. Yeah, I use Z shell, star dot D, oops. Okay, uh, that looks good. So there's a number of these cases, right? So you're gonna see that uh, you, can, you can find like, I don't know, um, 
178 lines in a you know you know uh, 500,000 lines library. So there are a number of cases in which yes, you do one scoping, and what you do is you simply add a scope, and you're done. Uh, so Thank, yes, like one more extension. Like, uh, but if you want something from the scope, like you want to have this type uh, in the end, but you need to do some pre-computations to have this type. But right, so if you want like a scope for partially, and you can use a lambda. Right, so there's always another trick you can do. So you know, it's again, it's eliminating a scope that's difficult, not adding it. So you can use a lambda, you can call a function and go in a completely different scope, etc. So th that's an easy problem to tackle. Thank you for asking. Okay, thank you. So I have a question about the code readability. In uh, sorry, with the, the code readability with this, readability, uh, yes, with this paradigm. If we start to to use this paradigm to write like everyday code, mm -hmm. does it provoke any problems with code being less readable and uh, uh, difficult to reason about because of this combinatorical explosion? Thank you for asking. Um, well, I would say it solves more readability problems that it add, than it adds. And here's why. Consider this. Consider you're going to a completely different universe. You go to Mars. I don't know. Uh, you go to a completely different universe where people use programming languages, but they have no if. Ah, whenever you want to make a decision, you've got to do something completely weird, like write another function or something, right? So you go to these, these uh, I can't say people because they're, not, they're aliens, right? So you go to these aliens and you say, well, you know, uh, how about this? Uh, how about you write like if and condition and you do this and else you do that? And everybody's like, oh my god, this is so awesome! These humans are kind of smart, right? But believe it, this is what happens here with all metacode. All metaprogramming right now has no if. I mean, can you, can you imagine a world in which you have no if for code? How ridiculous it would be? Thank you. So what you want, actually, is wait a second, wait a second. I want if, and that makes code easy, because I think it's an easy argument to make. If makes regular code easier than no if. Right? But amazingly, at this point got missed somewhere on the, on the way in uh, metaprogramming. It was like, oh, if you want to do a decision, you've got to write another specialization like an idiot. Why do I have to write another specialization like an idiot? I want to write an if right there. I want to say, if this is zero, then you know, this is my special case, and I'm done in a line, not done in like 10 other lines. So I, I'm not, I don't, it's not only I believe or I think, it, uh, it is factual truth from my experience in the D language that the, it makes code vastly easier to read and understand. Not, not a little, not somewhat, vastly easier. So there's no, there's no contest there. All of these like things that kind of, actually all of these, I think like quite honestly, I think 25% of all meta code is if that's kind of expanded. Thank you for asking. Thank you, I hope for such an answer. <laughs> Hello. Yes, please. Um, could you go to the slide with the cell index, the motivational example? So my question is, are you aware of std conditional? <laughs> Am I aware of std conditional? I'm aware of state condition. It would allow me to do this with a lot more code. Uh, I don't think so. No, in this particular example, like with that conditional, the cell index is a one-liner. Yeah, well, I agree that for some cases, state condition is exactly what you want. However, for general use, you just need the thing, just you want to write an if right now, and that's not state conditional. State condition is, it has its own it interests its own type and whatnot. So I don't think conditional is exactly what you want. How do you do the second with uh, still conditional? Um, I would declare the structs um, separately. Right, so you need, you need to do some like an alias. massaging, yeah, which is more lines of code. I, I told you, there's nothing in std optional. It still have 1,500 lines of code. Those come from somewhere, right? I'm making the argument not it can't be done. I'm making the argument that it can't only, can only be done with a lot more code. Sure. Thank you for asking. Thank you. 
I thank you for the talk. So I wanted to elaborate a bit on the readability side of things. I think we are used to the fact that C++ is a uh, typed language, and this brings a lot of python -ish into it, which I personally love the language, but it brings a new way of thinking and reasoning about the code and some <coughs> libraries we are using, for example. Uh, what would you think would be a good way to then describe this kind of interface? Would it be possible to combine this with concepts, for example, to say these are required, these are optional interfaces, so that uh, they're easier to reason about and to read and to use in day-to-day -day life? Um, so could we combine these with concepts? And um, so I'll tell you my opinion. It's not, I mean, don't believe me. Um, I think concepts are a waste of time. I, don't, I, I think they're not adding anything, uh, anything meaty to the language, and I think they add some more checking in a place that doesn't need checking. So I'm coming from that angle. So you can imagine that my answer would be, well, I don't think they should. You know, I, I don't think they should be combined. I think, uh, I think really what we're, the effort should go in C++ is we got we to gotta do this, this whole introspection thing, and we got to do it right. And I think cons you know, concepts and meta classes, they're, they're just distractions on the way. I don't think that's my, I know it's a terrible opinion, but I'm, I'm sorry, this is what I'm, I'm, I believe. So I think um, uh, with regard to the Pythonic uh, kind of uh, thing, everything is happening, again, before compilation, so it's sort of design time. So that makes it uh, way, uh, way earlier to, uh, for us to worry about uh, things like type checking. So I, I think that it's not a big problem there. But you know, I think it remains an open question. Thank you. Hey, Andre. Uh, thanks Hello. for the great talk. Thank uh, you. I had the exact same question, but it was my concern was not really about the Pythonic thing, but more than um, yeah. If we don't use concept at the same time, if I want to know basically what you're going to query, I need to read the entire implementation of your checked in, for example. Mm -hmm. So I need to go through the thousand line of of basically what, what's implemented to see what exactly you're going to query to know mm -hmm. what I can implement on your right. side. And that's why the same question about concept, if concept could help just to say, hey, right. this is basically what, you know, the optional wouldn't really check or do anything, wouldn't constrain, but at least would tell me, and I wouldn't need to go through the code basically to, um, to see what, what is being queried. Makes sense. Uh, let me pull up a page real quick. Uh, I don't know what I did here. Okay, so I'm gonna make a big slide here. Um, how do I magnify this? All right, um, is this visible? Um, I have the list of um, primitives here. Oh yeah, I think it's visible, right? Yeah. So this would be the documentation. So by the way, I think a good thing would be for people to use uh, things like Doxygen and documentation generator, so the documentation is together with the code, in style as common. So these are good tactical pieces of advice that could, uh, I could give anyone. But uh, once, you, once you have uh, such a design by introspection uh, in hand, uh, what you need to do is simply document uh, the optional interfaces and make the documentation available to anybody who wants to implement those, uh, those things. And that, works just dandy. Um, I agree it's not uh, so some that is going to fail if you don't, you know, if you don't, uh, if you misspell things or whatever. And I do agree it, it did happen. It did happen. But I think the answer to that is not more typing, which is just more, more overhead, more, uh, more cognitive overhead for us. It's just this is completely before compilation. Just use any designer would, no designer would design without the, the book, right? The Docu documentation of the components they're designing with. You got to read the fine manual, RTFM. Read the fine manual, <laughs> right? Thank you for asking. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I have a question about debugging this kind of program. Let's say you write this hash table class and uh, something is wrong. How can you see what uh, path was taken within this program? Do you have support from your debugger or your, your compiler or some kind of other tool? How do you know, how do you debug this code when you don't know exactly which decision was made by exactly. each of these static ifs? Um, 
Thanks for asking. So, by the way, you're asking, uh, uh, like a lot of people have been asking about things that I have direct, uh, direct uh, experience and history with. So the way to debug this, you need to have a coverage analyzer. And fortunately, this is an existing but rather obscure tool in GCC and Clang. So you can generate coverage information. And the way it comes, it's after compilation, you have a text line, a text file with the line, uh, whether it was covered or not, it comes, uh, there's a number here that comes how many times it was covered. And uncovered code is going to appear with, I forgot, it's like no nothing or zero or whatever. So you're going to use a coverage tool, and you're going to make sure that the code that you, you wanted to use is covered. So that would be the, the tool. Of course, you can imagine any number of better tools for that. And I, I hope they're going to come about as this technique becomes more used. Um, one simple thing is, how about you, you generate the code uh, resolving all static ifs? Right? That, it would be nice. Give me the code with all the static ifs done. It turns out it's difficult because of you know, a variety of technical issues. But you know, it would be a, a good tool to have. Thank you for asking. First, thank you very much for this really amazing keynote. Thank you. I have a question regarding your I want everything statement. So when people talk about reflection or inspection, they very often talk about the ability to iterate over member variables in a structure or class. And that is something we can do today if you're willing to use, for example, the Clang APIs. So in a, in a, in a sense, the ability to iterate over member variables is just an example of what you could do. So if you say, I want everything, do you believe we really need everything that a compiler is giving us, like Clang, through its APIs? Or is there a limit? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, it's a very good, like, you know, how much do you want, really? Is that, do you really want literally everything? You can't, actually, everything is ill-defined because everything is a subset of everything. But anyway, um, in the panel sense. So anyway, so um, here, here's my point. Um, I think uh, the APIs exposed by Clang, uh, they are a good insight into what could be done, so that, because they literally offer everything, right? So they, you could get the ST and do whatever you want. Um, I think that would be uh, a bit much because of very, kind of very technical reasons. For example, what is the ST of a C++ program? Well, it turns out uh, it's not a clear, there's no clear answer to that. Because maybe some ASTs are going to include some physical tree uh, details like the you know, parentheses and braces and stuff. What if you have int i equals open paren 5 close paren? Do you eliminate the parens or not in the AST? Because it's redundant. But the fact is you have them in the, your source code, so are they going to be reflected in the AST or not? So there's a bunch of uh, details like that. And I did notice that the AST APIs of these compilers turn out to be highly variable from one release to another. Right? So that makes the problem difficult to, like, makes the specification difficult to uh, define, right? So I want the AST, but, you know, wait a second, what's the exact AST? So I think that would be a much more difficult thing to do, and the, inc the incremental um, benefits of it would not be very big. So what I do want is introspection in the sense that I want to be able to open a module, like, you know, include a header and ask about all declarations in that module. I don't want to enter function bodies right now or, or that kind of stuff. But I do want to be able to completely represent the, declaration, the declarations within a C++ compilation unit. All right, thank you. Thank you. First of all, thanks for the uh, very nice talk. Thanks for having me. Um, I have a question, maybe a, a bit of a syntactic uh, matter. <clears throat> in, at least in C++, when you want to find a method that's much more true than just the name of the method, uh, you might want to query the type of the arguments, the type of the return type, whether it's const, whether it uh, can throw exceptions, and so on. And how do you imagine that uh, to be in, in uh, such a program? It might be a very uh, long-winded uh, if statements. So this is the last question. So I think that the gist of the question was I, I can't take anymore. The session is done. So I, I can take it offline. Uh, so the last question is, uh, well, given C++'s rich type system, is, is that correct? Given C++'s rich type system and a lot of things you can have on any declaration, how do you characterize those? I think those you need, you know, does this compile is a good answer to that. 
because does this compile is simply you just have the sample code that you want to make sure it works, and you just check it whether it works or not. So that would be a reasonable answer. Other than that, you need to cope with all the kind of visits cost or not or whatever, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, we're done, friends. Happy lunch. Thank you very much for having me. You've been great. You've been awesome. Thank you.